we have 24 hours in the day. You know, if we're lucky, 16, 17 of that, that we're awake, people are fighting for every minute of our awareness, every minute of our attention to sell us something or to get us to feel some way or to get us to think about something in some way and to, to buy some product. I'm hopeful that this pulls people out of that groove, out of that, that sort of rut that we're in and gives them a broader perspective to say, oh, we are a species amongst a myriad of species. Well, let's get started. We are out here at Cedar Cove Feline Conservatory, just east of Lewisburg with Steve Klein. Steve's the board president and has been here 20 years, right? Since uh, started volunteering in 2002. Park opened in Labor Day of 2000. Labor so Day of 2000. Long after the park opened. So why don't you tell everybody a little bit about the history that started sure. in the jungles of Vietnam yeah. and turned into a dream. And <laughs> well, William Podorf, our founder, was a Lewisburg native. He had been an animal lover his entire life. He had taken care of raccoons, bobcats, uh, coyotes, all sorts of things that people had brought him. And when he went overseas to Vietnam, he had seen firsthand what was happening to the endangered species. That was around the time of the Endangered Species Protection Act that was trying to prevent the uh, exploitation, the importation, the, the, all of the, the trafficking of these animals. And that really drove him to want to do something about it. That, it, it, that fired up a passion in him for these animals in particular because they were losing their voice. So after he'd come back from Vietnam, he'd done a variety of other jobs, but still continued taking care of animals his entire life. At one point, a friend of his had purchased a tiger cub and brought that cub over to Billy after he had lost the ability to take care of it not knowing what to do, Billy took him in. And that really started the process for him of working with a woman in Arkansas who had the largest tiger sanctuary in the United States and uh, going through the USDA to get his exhibitor's license. So with the exhibitor's license, with the 10 acres that we're on that was donated by our next door neighbor, and uh, another board member, George Criswell and his family, as well as a conditional use permit from Miami County, he was able to open the park Labor Day of 2000. And we've been here ever since. Unfortunately, Billy is no longer with us. He passed away in 2012, but we continue on in his legacy. And the goal is really, as I stated earlier, to give these animals a voice, to let people know what is happening to these animals, to their wild habitats, their populations. In 1900, there were 100,000 tigers in the wild and nine subspecies. In 100 years, they lost three of those subspecies in 97% of their population. There's now about 3,500 cats total in the wild uh, throughout uh, Southern Asia so in India. So in the same time, our population has gone from 1.5 billion to 7.5 billion. And the effect that that is having with our demands on the natural resources is decimating their habitats. It's cutting off their migratory corridors. It's running these populations to an extinction within probably the next 15 to 20 years tops. And it's, the message isn't just that these animals are, are nice to have, that they're, they're a beautiful thing to look at in the forest. It's very similar to the tale of the wolves in Yellowstone National Park. The apex predators, the keystone species are the regulators of the ecosystems that they occupy. They are the ones keeping the balance. In the case of Yellowstone, with the absence of the wolves, the deer population, the elk population exploded and took over. They wound up consuming everything at the expense of the diversity of the other species. So without these animals, these forests are falling apart. In Yellowstone, they put wolves back and the park began restoring itself, showing just how critical a function they play in that food chain. So again, our goal is to bring that awareness to people, to give them an opportunity close to the city to come out to see these animals up close and personal, to see these actually animals actually reacting to our guests while they're learning something about their environment, about what we can do about it. Um, Let me uh, adjust something here right sure. quick. I'll, I'll let you narrow me in because I can wax nostalgic at length about so many different topics. So you're really not, um, I think what's unique here is really not as much a zoo as is a rescue center. A lot of these animals you're bringing in have been abused. Right. They've had trauma. They've been in Private situations of neglect. Or other facilities that didn't have the resources or the, the uh, training to take care of them. 
so we fall in kind of a gray area. I'm sure people are familiar with the train wreck that was the Tiger King. There, there's a number of operations around that are in that same vein. If they are looking to exploit these animals, it's about their own persona, their, their own financial intake, and it really isn't about the animals per se. Here, the foundation was animals that were in need of care, that needed a, a home for the rest of their lives. Uh, for instance, Journey, our, our tigress down there, we got it six months old. Uh, these two came to us six months old from a place that was using them for a pay to play experience. By the time they hit six months plus, they're no longer viable. And when you have an animal that's going to live to be 15 to 20 years old, that becomes an expense and a liability that they no longer want to be responsible for. So for them, it's all about money. It's not about what these cats represent. So in giving these animals a home for the rest of their life, in exchange, we ask them to be the ambassadors, as I mentioned, to draw the public out here to allow us to tell that story. But really, it is primarily about their care. And everything that we're doing is to try to take the footprint that Billy started originally. And to improve upon that, to expand upon that, sorry, hairball, ah, cats. Um, <laughs> to improve upon that, to expand our facilities, to give these animals the best conditions that we can possibly give them with the resources that we have available. And to, again, to try to make an impact in our community, to try to raise that awareness so that people will at least start thinking about what is looming in the future. So the average person, you know, would would look over here and they wouldn't know that that this animal's had trauma or it's had abuse. That's but you goal. know, that's, that's our goal yeah. is that these animals are calm and relaxed. We do have some animals that, that have had bad encounters in the past. We have a cougar named Tom, who we should be able to see later, who was purchased by a truck driver to be a ride along companion in a semi that lasted from three months until four months of age when he went to a bar owner. In southwestern Iowa. And that lasted, I think, a week before the sheriff intervened. Then he went to a private individual and finally a firefighter who raised him until a year old before he came out here. Now, if certain male physiotypes walk into the park, Tom will become incredibly nervous. He will move to the back of his enclosure and start pacing until he goes into his den and tries to hide. So he's had bad encounters in the past. There are other uh, cats like Journey, for instance. Uh, the first few uh, days of working with her realized that if you raised your hands around her, her head would go down, her ears would go flat. But that indicated to me that the people that had her had been taught, oh, just smack her on the nose and tell her no, she'll behave, she'll listen, which might work with a very small tiger, but they don't stay small very well. So it's trying to assess the stresses that they've encountered in their past lives and to ameliorate those as much as we can to, to, to minimize any of those outside influences and, and make them as comfortable as possible so that as you said people hopefully don't realize until they get the story that these animals have had a bad experience we want them to be as happy as we can possibly make them when you come out and you take the tour the folks on the tour talk a lot about building trust and trying to build trust with it. how do you build trust with an animal who's been in a bad situation <laughs> that's, that's a very good question food is a great start but I don't like to rely on food. There, there are a lot of people who will do that and you, you build up that association and now they expect food from them. If they don't get that, they're disappointed. It's really your presence being calm around them, uh, letting them see that, that you are not focused on them. A lot of people, they're so curious. They, the first thing they want to do is, oh, look at the cat and I, I want to stick my hands out. An animal reaching out with their paws is in attack mode. Us reaching out with our hands is an aggressive move. So avoiding that letting these animals be comfortable relaxed if if they want to go somewhere in isolation let them have that isolation and it's, it's a very long slow process kamar for instance our uh 14 year old male bengal tiger right here came to us at two and a half years old he was with his sister and they were both physically mature at that point so they needed to be separated he was incredibly mistrustful for years it took about nine years before he would actually let me he he would come up on the deck and lay down, roll his back towards me and let me engage him. Let me even make contact with him. Now it's to the point that he'll chuff, he'll come up, he'll lay down. He'll let me, I, I'll rub as far as the back of the head. But even this morning, if I get too close, he's going to try to reach. He's going to try to snap. That's just their instincts. These animals are fully natural species. They're not domesticated. They're not inbred in any, any way to try to mute those instincts. So they have all of that purbling just below the surface. And you've got to be very aware of that when you're working with these animals. 
Now we don't go in with the larger cats. We don't work with them. We don't try to train them, make them do tricks or anything like that. It's simply to build that rapport and that relationship. When they're young, I will work with the, the, the smaller cats. Again, acting like a weaker sibling, letting them call the shots. And just being there as that presence, non-threatening, goes a long way towards building that rapport. Frank, do you want to unmute? I believe you got a question. Yes, Randall, fascinating. Tell me, is there ever a, a situation where uh, any of those cats can be released back out into the wild or once they become- Excellent question. Un Unfortunately not. These animals start out their early life. They'll spend up to two years with their mother. She will train them how to hunt, how to conceal themselves, protect themselves, all the things they need to be successful. But by the time they're two years old, she will actually become aggressive and run them off. She's coming back into estrus. She's looking to have more offspring. She wants them nowhere around. So they go through an extensive training process with the mother. Now, while these cats are all fully intact, they've got all their claws, they haven't been neutered or, or spayed. Uh, they have that capability that we could, but there's two main factors going against them. First is they don't have the training. They wouldn't know how to survive. And it's the same reason we don't feed live prey to these animals. They would capture it, they would play with it, but they wouldn't kill it. They would injure it. It would be very cruel to do to that animal, but they, they just, they've never completed that entire process, partly because they've been hand fed their entire lives. But also the other big factor is anywhere that we could put them where tigers still have habitats are currently mm -hmm. occupied by the existing tiger populations. And there is no place that they could have sanctuary, no place that we could release them unless we were to set aside large dedicated swaths of land specifically for habitats for them. So, you know, the question is what, what is the outcome of this? Because I struggle with, with this all the time. I hate the thought of having cats in captivity. I would love to see them in the wild, but we are at this critical juncture in human history where they do not have the odds in their favor to be able to survive. So I feel like we are trying to bridge that gap until the technology emerges to allow us to shift things like our large scale commercial agriculture, the, the deforestation for cattle grazing and things that are decimating their habitats to maintain the population diversity so that we will have an opportunity when that chance presents itself to re return them back into the wild. To that end, one of the things that I would love to become involved in or help spearhead the process of with, with groups the world over is to begin genomic sequencing of these animals. We have so many different emerging technologies that can be applied to conservation fronts all over, not just for these, but other endangered animals. And with the decreasing cost, the expediency and the simplicity of, well, relative simplicity of sequencing genomes anymore, I see no reason why we shouldn't be gathering the genomes of all of these animals to have in an archive in a library accessible to researchers, to students, universities for their own research purposes. but in a literal Jurassic Park sense that we are emerging, we have a technology emerging that within the next 10 years, we could take a sequence genome of one of these animals, reverse that process, have a complete set of chromosomes, implant that into a host cell, into a surrogate mother, and start rebuilding the population diversity with, sorry, fur, with essential clones of these animals. We have a number of items in our uh, display building that are from, Fish and Wildlife Service, their skins, their pelts, their skulls, their teeth of animals that were harvested in the wild for either, uh, you know, trophy collecting purposes, jewelry, all the curiosities that you can think of that, that drive people to, to go after these animals, but they still have viable DNA. So animals that we know were wild at one point could potentially yield that genetic material to help preserve these populations. So that's that is my own personal view of the long-term plan of what we can do, but it's a multi-forked attack right now, well, attack mission that we have to try to work to raise the awareness to preserve the very uh, environments that they would go in in the first place. That's my short answer. If you got questions, uh, type them in the chat and we'll get unmuted. You know, uh, Steve, I talk to people all the time who wake up every morning heading to jobs they hate. And you said one of the coolest things the other day when we were out here, when you said, I don't make much money, but I'm the wealthiest I've ever been. And I thought, I mean, that gave me goosebumps. It was like so cool. Talk about what you've learned on this 
journey, what's inspired you and, and what you learned by doing what you do? So much. A, my skill set has skyrocketed out here through the applications in maintaining and repairing the park, but doing something where every day I get to connect with the public during the week, I, I give school tours um, on the weekends when we're open to the public, I'm engaging people to hydroponic gardens with all sorts of, of facets of this. And to make that contact and to see that idea pass on to somebody else so that it is germinated in another mind, that there's somebody else that has that awareness that brings focus to their problems is incredibly rewarding. But just the relationship I have with the animals, being in a position of doing what I'm doing, which, which is arduous, it's never easy, it really... I, I lived in Ames, Iowa for years, so I'm not a fan of the winters, and especially when it comes to caring for the animals, that's the least favorite part about it. But I'm still doing something every day that I'm passionate about, and there is always a desire and a drive to do what I can to improve, to make this better. And it's allowed me, it's forced me in some ways and allowed me by dint of, of, of my position out here to expand my tool set to innovate to come up with new concepts new ideas and to push my own personal boundaries on their behalf but as i said at the end of the day i'm doing something that i feel is making a contribution to the world is helping to make the world a slightly better place you know you make the kind of world you want to live in and in the years that i spent in advertising uh, doing web design, things of that nature. In the, the early years, I was really enjoying it. It was the early years of HTML, Flash, and JavaScript. So there was a lot of room for creativity. And by the time that had wound down right before Billy, Billy had passed away, and I was really taking on responsibility here, I had lost a passion for it because I was falling into the, this cycle of creating the same product over and over again with a slightly different color or slightly different wording for people that weren't necessarily interested. And, you know, Ogilvy on advertising, I think it was years ago, and on my first elements of advertising class, uh, one of the, the key tenets I remember was you have to believe in the product that you're selling. And this is one of the things that I've become so passionate about as I discover more and more about the interconnectivity of these ecosystems and how that diversity is being challenged and how it can be supported and restored. It, uh, oh, I just lost my train of thought. I've got so many different <laughs> tangents to all of this. Um, but it is just, every day is a new opportunity. And I can't imagine going back into an environment where I, I would feel like what I was doing had very little impact aside from just increasing somebody's bottom line somewhere. You know, that, that that is not a positive net outcome for my activities. So incredibly fortunate is what I feel. So you wake up every day loving what you do. <laughs> I wake up every day sore, <laughs> but I love what I do. Absolutely. Hey, you talk about a little bit there about the ecosystems. You've traveled to India to look at the uh, the impact of mangroves yes. on on both wildlife and erosion. Well, <laughs> so we have supported a number of groups for years. One of the things that we're adamant about is supporting conservation efforts globally. And we have supported panthera.org. We have supported another group called the Fishing Cat Conservancy. And these are groups that, that we we're adamant about supporting because they have boots on the ground they are in the front lines they are actively working with the communities in those environments with the animals it's not just throwing money at a problem hoping something happens and right before all the, the pandemic went down we had actually gotten to a point where for the first time ever we were able to actually go out and join these groups BJ, who's our vice president, she and I came out here together in 2001 to take that first visit. She lives a mile and a half away. And she and I are kind of the inheritors of the park from, from Billy. And uh, we've been the ones responsible. But she has gone to Brazil in uh, 2019. 
She was down there in the Pantanal, which is a Jaguar corridor that was established by Alan Rabinowitz, who's unfortunately no longer with us. He was the head of Panthera.org, but he had worked with the governments as well as the local communities. He understood that you had to bring everybody together, that you had to find common ground to bring everybody on the same page to affect an, an a viable solution. So she was down there sort of following his footsteps, meeting some of the other members of Panthera, um, helping uh, along there with the sightings and the population count. And then uh, last year, it, it was a very Twilight Zone episode. I left on a Friday the 13th, or I left on a, a leap day and landed on Friday the 13th in the middle of a <laughs> pandemic. But I had gone over to the far Eastern coast of India to work with uh, their base camp, one of their base camps. The Fish and Cat Conservancy's goal is to offset or shift the phenomenon of aquaculture. What is happening is they're taking areas of mangrove forest on the coast, they're bulldozing them out, building up berms of, of dirt, and then using that as a paddock for fish. So they will pump in the fresh and the salt water that is in their locality and raise fish in those ponds, but they only last for about five years before the water is just too brackish and non-viable. And if you're familiar with, uh, it was probably a dozen years or so ago, we started getting reports that the tilapia and the shrimp and things that were farmed from overseas that we were getting on the grocery stores had high concentrations of toxins. This is one of the reasons because they have fresh water that is coming down from the rivers that they are pumping into these ponds, but that is the effluent from cities far upstream that are dumping anything and everything. So all of that's getting concentrated in the food supply and the fish. Now, the other problem is decimating these mangrove forests eliminates the habitats for a number of other species, including the fishing cat that was talking about. He's talking. Uh, well, we can but, hear him back uh, <laughs> So the, the fishing cat is even more endangered than the tiger. There's less than 500 in the wild, but they only live in these coastal mangrove forests. Now, the other huge impact is, as was seen with uh, both Bombay and Calcutta this past year, when they had a tropical cyclone that struck the coast, one was heavily inundated with water. The other sustained maybe 5% of the damage that they would have otherwise sustained because they had their mangrove forest restored and back intact. So they're working to retrain the local populations to show them just how unprofitable these these endeavors are in mm -hmm. the long term and if you look at uh, the satellite views you can see there there's isolated pockets of forest and you're just surrounded by these rectangular paddocks where all of this is going on uh there is a, a video on our youtube channel that is the first of three chapters i'm working on the other two but it is the uh neighbors it is uh the story of me traveling to that base camp and during that, the telling of that tale, you can actually see as we get to Amapuram, just before the coast, the characteristic of the landscape changes. And you start to see these paddocks everywhere. You start to see the effect of it. Um, but it's things like that, being able to actually connect with those individuals in these communities that are making that difference, not only allows us to help make a small impact in that respect, but it also gives us an enormous wealth of information to bring back the weekend venues to help inform our tours and uh, spread the word even more. Now, I, we have purchased, we're on 10 acres right now that was donated by our neighbor, George. Two years ago, we purchased from him an additional 126 acres. So we've got a lot of additional land, we've got big plans, for expansion of our main animal habitats to get them as much space as we can. Uh, but at the same time, on the southern half of the property, there is a beautiful wilderness. And the goal is to create nature trails, hiking paths, et cetera, within there, but also another base camp that I can have connected via Wi-Fi so that we could actually have groups out here that are communicating with the groups in the field to tie a, a global network together so that as these other groups are in their environments doing what have you. We have lines of communication, we can share that, we can bring in school groups, et cetera, just to, to really start that network and let people see how small and connected this world really is. Uh, Nick, you wanna unmute for your question? 
Yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for, for being here today. I really enjoy, you know, you mentioned passion and uh, you almost didn't have to tell us that you're passionate about what you do because it's obvious in every word that you say. So I, I commend you on finding your, your passion. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. And I also was curious about just in particular um, in the, uh, with, with your facility, are there any cats that you have that, um, that are pairs that can socialize or, um, or are they all separate? And then if not, like what, what kind of enrichment or socialization are they able to get? Because I know it can be tricky. It, it is very tricky. Uh, we do have some cats that are paired off and can socialize. Some of our smaller cats are uh, bobcats that are local here. We also have a pair of lions. Some of you may have heard Tonka caroling earlier. Um, and we can begin wandering around that way. Right? Yeah, let's go walk in and um, show folks some of what you got here. And, uh, yeah, because this, so just to give you an idea, this is the first have, or first enclosure that Billy built for the Tigers on the new property. It backs up to an acre of land out there. They take turns going out into that habitat since they can't play nicely with each other. They go out one at a time. Um, right now, Sundari has access to three quarters of it. Uh, Mohan has access to one quarter of it. I'm currently in the process of dividing that up into four sub habitats. We'll have four cats out. And instead of going out for a couple of days and back in, they'll go out in rotation into each one for a week in succession. So that means they're outside in the grassy area under the trees for a month at a time before they come back in. So in terms of enrichment, We've tried barrels, fire hose toys, boomer balls, all sorts of things for them to play with. And those last maybe about half a day at best before they lose interest. <laughs> it's really because they are social in nature and, and they are curious about each other. They've been raised in captivity in a social environment. They are more curious about each other. One of the things that I've noticed is as I've gotten the first habitat division underway, the cats have become much more active when they're outside. They're chasing along the fence lines, they're playing with each other. And as a, a cat comes in and another cat goes out, the first thing that they will do is go from tree to tree, smelling and marking. You know, they're, they're sniffing, they love marking their territory. If you've seen a cat walk up to the corner of a couch or a, a refrigerator and smell it, turn around, lift their tail up and, and they shake their rear end. They're trying to do the same marking behavior. It's a calling card, it's a, a social, who's who, who's in the area. So we're always really in terms of enrichment right now, my goal is to get them off this concrete onto more space. And even, even so in doing so, it's, I've never had kids of my own yet, but I'm assuming it's a lot like teenagers because they will have access to these large areas and they will spend most of their time inside. So it can be a little frustrating <laughs> in that respect. You have to kick them out. Chantel uh, has a question about that. Yeah. Yeah. Chantel. So uh, I I grew up on a farm, and so I'm familiar with kind of the animal moving them in and out of places. And I'm wondering, like, how how do you how do you get them in and out? Like, how do you herd them in and out? Uh, food is a great resource. But actually their own curiosity is a, a big factor there. Um, all of these animals are food motivated. They will respond to, uh, you know, if, if we have half a chicken or something, just waving a piece of meat, any indication that we have food, they will come running. In fact, uh, Mohan, who's out in the habitat, his brother passed away a few years ago, unfortunately to a heart condition. But those two cats were out together. They were socialized, they'd grown up together so they could be together. Um, we, we have a bell that we ring every time we feed them. And one February morning at about 3 a.m., I heard this success, Tonk is going. Um, I heard a succession of roars that was not just your typical, hey, get out of my face sort of roar. And I came running out of the house and both of the cats were in the habitat. They were reared up. They were basically facing off with each other. And my first reaction was to come running right back over to the dinner bell and to ring it. As soon as I rung it, they immediately broke whatever they were focused on and came trotting over for food. So in this case, <laughs> food trumps all. But it's, it's uh, I mean, their curiosity is a big factor. You know, cats and doors, they have to be on the other side no matter what. So it, 
it's just giving them an awareness that there's something new and they will come over and explore. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, we'll hit uh I said the, the new Wi-Fi is right there, so we should have good signal all the way around. This is Jai. We can take a look at her really quickly because I'd like you to be able to see her back. So Jai is a primary example of, <coughs> pardon me, a uh, quote unquote rescue. Her back has a, a little dip right behind her shoulder blades and a kink, and it's as flat as a board. That is because she spent the first 10 years of her life performing as a circus cat, essentially, for a small group of cats that travel to state fairs, things like that. Her trick was to stand on her back shoulders and hop over barrels over the backs of her sisters. The problem is to train them to stand upright like that, you have to put a leash and a collar on them. You get them on their back legs, then you hang the collar on a hook so that they can't put their front paws on the ground. They have to stand upright. They overdevelop those muscles and that long-term drive for our entertainment has essentially destroyed her physiology. So at 15, well, she's 16 years old now, but ever since she was 12 years old, she's had a limp. The muscles of her scapula, uh, the pectorals aren't nearly as muscular as they are tendinous because she wasn't using her front paws to run. She was using them as, them as counterweights, very small motions. So another reason I'm trying to extend the habitat area is to give her more room to get out there and actually run. Interestingly enough, when she first came to us and she was running back and forth in the enclosure, she would not run with her back legs moving. They, they both hopped at the same time. They landed in the exact same spot, just as if she was still jumping from barrel to barrel, the way she was trained. Hmm. So back here, Let's see who's, who's awake and who's sleeping. Oh, there's Boris. These are Eurasian lynx. Ignoring the cows immediately behind them, of course. But we do have uh, cattle grazing on uh, two sides of us. And the cats are typically, as you would imagine, they're, they're, their natural instincts kick in. They become alert when the cattle are nearby. They will crouch down and watch them and move uh, back and forth in anticipation of the meal that unfortunately doesn't come. <laughs> but it's just perfect course for these animals. That's how they behave. So Boris has all of this space. We have two Coatamundis that are asleep back here. They are relatives of the raccoon. There is Tom. Let's go around this way so we can see Tom. Uh, there's Bob, the bobcat. Now he is in there with another bobcat named Midge. Bob was found by the side of the road where his mother was hit by a car and injured. He had been nursing at the time. So a couple stopped, picked them up, took them into a veterinarian. They were unfortunately not able to save the mother and she passed away, but now they had Bob on their hands. So they declawed him and filed down his canines trying to keep him around the clinic. That lasted for about they realized, okay, this is not a viable solution for him. So they brought him out here to us. Willow, his, uh, his playmate in there, was found on a gentleman's back porch. He went out to investigate a rustling sound and found this bobcat kitten rooting around in the boxes. It came right up to him, incredibly friendly, jumped up into his lap, was uh, purring, and he realized this was not a wild bobcat. Somebody had most likely purchased her from a breeder, had her in their house, trying to make a house pit out of her. That did not last, obviously. Uh, but instead of taking her to a facility that could give her proper care, they just dumped her off in the woods. And she did exactly what you would expect. She came right back to human, right back to civilization. You know, it's dark and scary out here. My show's on at half an hour. I'm hungry. Somebody let me in. Um, yeah, that's, that's not uncommon, especially since bobcats are very common around this area. We have two more bobcats next to her. Uh, Max is in his den. Sorry, but we can see him right back here. And he is next to Millie. Both Max and Millie came from uh, Milford Nature Center. He's yeah, he's tucked back in the den. Hopefully, he'll stick his head out for us. But they were found by people in the wild to take them as house pets. Obviously, that doesn't last. 
take them out. He's, a, he's actually a very sweet cat, very playful because he was socialized. Now this goes back to the, the earlier question about can we release these animals back in the wild? Milford Nature Center is a rehabilitation center. They try to rehabilitate uh, raptors, other birds, um, wild, oh, here he is. Wildlife like uh, raccoons, squirrels, possum, thing like, things like that. The problem is the felines, once they have been separated from their mother, once they've been acclimated to humans, they are no longer able to be released in the wild for that very reason that, uh, that Willow came back to humanity. She was looking for sanctuary, looking for somebody to take care of her rather than having the ability to care for herself. Here's Tom. Tom is the cougar that I was mentioning that was purchased by a truck driver. Oh. 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 Thomas, he's actually purring right now. The cougar is the largest of the cats that can purr. They can't roar, but they can purr. So um, he's been here since he was a year old. He is now 15 years old. And he is a very sweet and friendly cat. But as I mentioned, he does have an aversion to certain male physiotypes because of some event in his past. And this space is an expansion I just finished last fall for him to give him a lot more. I adopted an Asian leopard cat and gave her a little bit of the original structure he was in. So it's a, a constant morphing puzzle game out here, basically, of you know bootstrapping to the next level, if you will, getting the enclosures improved and expanded while still containing, keeping everybody safe. I guess I'm curious, so why would riding around in a truck with a cougar in the cab be a good idea? <laughs> you, I, I do not want to stop at the same rest stop. That, yeah, yeah, so if you can imagine how wild a kitten is, they're running around and bouncing around inside the cab of a truck, it's hardly enough area for the animals to survive. Right. Yeah. Sounds like Buddha is waiting for his turn as well. Oh, this so this is the back of our property and this is the land behind there is a tree line all the way back over the rise and it's not quite a quarter of a mile back from where we're standing but the idea is that everything you see here would all be animal habitats in the near future just large spaces all connected against so the animals will move from one to the next to the next there he is So, where are you going? Yeah, flop. Yeah. This is Voodoo. Voodoo is a 20 year old African spotted leopard that came to us from a couple that bought him to be a house pet. He is declawed all the way around. And at 20 years now, you figure a 15 to 20 year lifespan in captivity is a good long life. And he's already 20. But you can see his paws are a little floppy, and that's because uh, declawing is removing the last segment of your fingers and severing the tendons that help you to uh, control that, that gait you know, that holds the integrity of your, your wrist structure together. But um, no, he's going to go after Mo. Mo is sitting there in the grass right next to him. There's a, a tiger that loves to come over. But he's waiting for me to come over there because he loves to stalk me. That's one of his favorite games. <laughs> but um, Voodoo, the leopard, came out to us. By the time he was half, uh, five and a half months old, they had called out to Billy to find out how to keep a niece and a nephew safe that were coming to visit. And he said, you're crazy. Why do you have a leopard? He's going to kill you. He was beating up two fully grown Rottweilers. He was pouncing on their backs from behind dark corners, shredding their furniture, marking his territory, all the things you expect of a leopard. But... Uh, for some reason they made that decision and fortunately they realized that, that they had to do something they did get in touch with somebody that was able to take care of him and that's why he came out here to us and so he's one of your first he was one of the first okay he's he is the last of the cast that was here when pj and i first visited so it's sad i mean we've i've been there for the passing of many of my friends but uh 
you know, it just reinforces the, the drive to continue and carry on for the rest of it. So this area, I finished this about five years ago. This is the biggest structure I've built so far. Because leopards and cougars are such they have to have a completely enclosed enclosure. They, a leopard can carry two to three times its body weight up into a tree, and it does so to avoid the other predators that would try to steal from it, lions and hyenas. Um, so the, again, the idea with uh, the enclosures is I'm trying to maximize the footprint and then using brand new steel, give them as much voluminous height as possible so that I can create walkways and, and uh, rises, elevations, platforms. Now the inside, that irregular mesh of steel is intended to be a mountainside. The whole goal is pretty soon, once I get the formula down for artificial rock, I'm going to be improving these enclosures with a lot of artificial rock structures that will create an indoor enclosure for them, a climate controlled den, as well as a lot more vertical surface for them to move on. Things that have planting basins for cane grass, bamboo, flowing streams of water, et cetera, to give it a much more naturalistic appearance and to give them a lot more variety, a lot more enrichment as well in space. Now, I'm gonna stare at Mohan. You can see his tail is flicking, but I'm going to walk over to him, staring at him, and then I'm going to turn my back. And you're going to see him. Oh, you have to wait. <laughs> Mo. Oh. He has a game where he will sit there and crouch down and watch me, and if I turn my back, he will begin stalking me. So, uh, shameless plug for our, our YouTube channel, um, because I've got several videos of the cats on there, including, uh, like I said, the first part of the India travel, drone footage of the new property, but there's a video up there called Silky Stalking, that is this very cat stalking me in a different part of the habitat. I just got my back turned to the fence, and the camera pointed over my shoulder, <laughs> and you can see just how intent he is and how focused he is on his prey. When I turn my head sideways and look in his direction, he will freeze. And that is how they go after their prey. Now their stripes are their camouflage. That light and dark banding, that irregular pattern blends in with the environments that they're in. The, uh, the grass is casting shadows and catching light. And their prey is more attuned to uh, picking out motion from the background. They're looking for things that are moving. So if he freezes, he will blend into that environment to a much greater degree. The prey is less likely to pick that out. Their attention goes off of him. They turn their, their backs. They begin wandering away. Now he's going to slink up and get as close as he possibly can before launching that attack. And in those videos, you can see it. There's, there's another one of Kamara, the white tiger, doing exactly the same thing. And I'm saying red light, green light as I turn my head. It doesn't matter what I'm saying. It's just that I'm looking at him or I'm looking away. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you stay right there. Don't even look. See how focused he is on you now. If I turn my back, well, <laughs> somebody's filming. It's uh... yesterday. He was doing that on all the tours I had. He was just in a good frisky mood. So. I'm not sure how well they'll be able to see. There's a ravine back there behind and another fence on the other side of that. This is one quarter of the habitat. So this quarter of an acre will be one habitat. There'll be a second unit down there, a third across the way, and a fourth just on the other side of this. And then a central enclosure. The goal is a central enclosure is steel and concrete. So we have a tornado shelter for them, a place we can secure them and lock them up. But also my goal is to have it capable for human occupancy on the top so that it would be load rated as an observation platform. So people would be able to walk out in the middle of the habitat, be behind eight feet of zoo glass, looking out on all the cats from above, just to give them a better observation point. R really feel like you're in their environment. And then, how's the signal doing? Still got a good signal. Excellent. Um, we try to wander down and at least see the lions. 
because they're always entertaining this time of morning. Now Mo is, oh, you can see he's watching. If I turn my back, maybe he'll come. Stop. Oh, yep. I don't know. Well, you wouldn't have heard anything because he was absolutely silent in his approach. And the all it took was me to turn my back for half a second <laughs> to entice him to get up and come after his prey. What do you think, buddy? And as I'd mentioned, his he was with his brother up until a couple of years ago. So he's a very social cat. He's very playful. Still would love to, to grab and bite and kill if he could. But not until he's had his fun first, I suppose. <laughs> and then Sonny... So the, uh, the cat that was on the far left as we were up front is Sundari, and that's her right there. So she's got access. This is three quarters of an acre that she's got access to. So again, this is going to be divided. Uh, and there's a pond out here, so we'll add water to it for them as well. These cats do like water. They will lay in the rivers. They will lay in ponds along the banks with their heads just below the grass line staying nice and cool during the day and waiting for an opportunity for another animal to come up for a drink of water. And then they've got lunch, they've got dinner. Uh, to that end, we feed these animals beef, chicken, pork, turkey, venison. We get uh, deer from hunters. We get um, cattle from ranchers. We, I, I'm going today to pick up food from the Walmart on 135th and Black Bob. We get food from the Price Chopper in Paola. I've got to call Belton, Missouri. There's a, a meat processing company there that's got meat for us. Um, Cold Point Logistics will give us 2,000 pounds of pork anytime I need it, basically. Tyson chicken as well. And that's why I don't have to prune that tree. <laughs> Maddie, you have a question? Yeah, it's a very silly question, but when you were turning your back, um, T tigers like to they will only attack you from behind right that's their preference or, yes okay i <laughs> i don't know if this is true i i was watching um or listening to a survivor man guy and he was talking about how he would put a mask on the back of his head when he was in the uh jungles to protect Absolutely. himself from the big cats would that work because is it the eyes what is it Yes, it's the eyes. In fact, uh, it, if we get a, a good chance to look at these cats, you'll see that their ears have a white spot on the back of them. Those are called eye spots. And the idea is that another predator behind them thinks that they're being watched by those eye spots. You know, they, they don't know which direction the animal is actually looking. So yes, that's absolutely true. People that live and work in jungles and forests around these predators will wear a mask on the back of their head for just that purpose. The animal has no idea if you're coming or going, which way you're facing. They, and as long as they think that you are watching them, they're gonna hold off. They're gonna wait for a, a, a better opportunity. They're gonna use that stealth and cunning as much as possible. They want to be successful and have you resist as little as possible. And that relies on the element of surprise. So if they don't think they have that element of surprise, they're, they're gonna be less likely to attack. Now, it's not a guarantee by any means, but it is certainly, much more effective so no not a crazy do, question at all that, Very, do do most cats act like that or or tigers tigers in particular I, i've got uh a couple of house cats that have acted like that i had one years ago that i would play games with I, i'm have you ever seen uh there's a video of a, a cat and a I think they've got it set to music from some Alfred Hitchcock movie or something. But the cat's in a closet and the camera looks out from behind the corner, then it ducks back behind the corner, it looks again, and the cat is closer, but it, it's frozen, it's not moving. Every time the camera hides and then moves back into view, the cat is closer and closer. So house cats exhibit that same behavior. They're gonna wait until their prey isn't looking. Same thing with, with uh, bird hunting or mouse hunting as well. So I would say it's probably across the board for the felines. Fascinating, really cool. Do do most cat like big cats have the white spots on the back of their ears, like the the eye spots? The leopards do, the jaguars do. 
jaguars do uh lions don't tigers do um i believe cheetahs do that's i'd have to go back and look that's a, a well, good so question then, so about lions since you're headed there anyway um what yeah what do they kind of do because they're kind of uh, associated with the king of the king of the jungle you know they're the king of the the yeah. animal um what so why is that or is that like does that occur in nature is there something that they do to uh make themselves the authority and nobody I, I, messes with them in many respects i think it has to do with the behavior of the males because the male lion is the figurehead he is the one in charge of the pride he is the one guarding the territory that they have. Oh, here, here he comes. Oh, God. Still have a good signal? Yeah, we're oh. Everybody can hear okay? Oh, God. Yep. Come here, buddy. Come on. But because of that, they are ferocious. The main that he has is to make him look more impressive so that other animals are less likely to challenge him. But he, uh, I don't know if you can see, there's a rut worn along the fence line where the other tigers are. That's not from him pacing, that's from him stopping. He will wait until a tiger gets right up next to the fence and he will come halfway across the habitat charging and roar at the last second and stop just before he hits, he hits the electric fence. So he is all about challenging, posturing, putting on that show of dominance. I think that's that's probably why he would have that moniker. It's just because they they assert themselves so much. Come here. No, I don't want to. If we go that way, we might lose signal. Come here, buddy. Chonka. He wants to go down to the gate. I, we got him when he was five and a half months old. Well, so uh, other questions? We had uh, Frank was asking about certifications and training you need to do this kind of work. Um, interestingly, there's very little regulation in terms of certifications and training. Now, we are inspected by the USDA, uh, by the Kansas Department of Wildlife, and by Miami County. But in terms of training, this was on the job training for BJ, for myself. We learned from Billy. Billy learned firsthand from Betty Jo Young in Arkansas um, and several others. There are a variety of husbandry classes. Um, we've uh, taken some sedation classes as well, just you know, for emergency situations. We've got equipment on hand to deal with sedation or a lethal response if we have to, in the worst case scenario. Um, but in terms of training, it's as I said, it, most of it's on the job. You know, there are various uh, zoological classes. We've got several vet techs who are in our volunteer staff, which is fantastic, because um, that really helps round out a lot of our capabilities. But there's, there's nothing really set in stone in terms of a series of classes or a curriculum that, that would lead you into something like this. Brian, go ahead and ask your question. Why, Randy, you're doing a fine job. <laughs> uh, curious if you ever, uh, I mean, have you experienced close calls with the animals? Danger? Um, I worked very hard to avoid those whenever possible. Uh, trying to keep the animals as safe as possible from each other, to try to keep the, the animals and the public safe, um, which is one of the reasons all of our tours out here, when you get a tour, it will be a guided tour. Uh, you know, so again, talking about the difference between us and zoos and, and some of the roadside attractions, you know, we're, we're here to make sure that everybody is safe. Um, when the animals are younger, I mean, so again, we don't go in with the large carnivores. When they're younger, I will work with them. I've had a couple of encounters, so they've gotten a little bit playful, but, uh, you know, nothing, I, I wasn't prepared to distract them from that situation and extract myself as well. Um, and never really had anything, anything serious, fortunately. I mean, we did have uh, a raccoon named Roxy that was brought out here and put in a temporary enclosure. And she got out of that and was running around the outside looking to get back in. But that was about the extent of it. 
um, yeah, like I said, I, my, one of my biggest fears is something bad happening to a human, to happening to an animal. Um, the enclosures, we have extra mesh panel in between so that the animals that have claws can't reach through and do any permanent damage. Where they have common fence lines here in the habitat, we have extra electric fence on both sides to make sure that they won't get up and pull on that. Because oddly, it's not so much that these cats in this condition would hurt each other as much as they would hurt themselves. They would bite and pull on this mesh out of frustration, trying to get to that other cat to the point that they might even break off their own canines. Hmm. Uh, we had, so Mohan, who's out in the habitat, the one that's kind of playful and stalking, he was born out here. It was a, an unplanned, happy accident of Billy's original seven tigers. He had two in the habitat together and lost track of their cycles was probably playing the right kind of music. I'm sure the moon was full. And then about 105 <laughs> days later, we had tiger cubs. Um, but when those cubs were being raised, they were down where the lions are. And there was a tree between the pond and the fence. The problem was anytime their father, who was a male Siberian, came out into the habitat, the first thing he would do is go down to that fence because he wanted to kill his offspring. He wanted the competition gone. And he would pace back and forth. There was a cedar tree that was probably a good eight to 10 inches in diameter. And he just kept biting at the bottom of the tree until he had bitten through about two thirds of that tree and he had to knock it down. And it was just out wow. of his own aggression that he had gone through that tree. Uh, wow. Gene has a question. Oh, hey, Steve, how you doing? Um, how many volunteers do you have out there? And how many of the volunteers have you encourage mentored or whatever to go on to pursue a similar profession or excellent question similar profession sure um we probably have a dozen core volunteers over here on a regular basis that, that's being either a saturday or a sunday i've got a few that are out here during the week to help me with the, the weekday chores and feedings um but we've had uh we have one volunteer who's out here on Tuesdays and Thursdays, who started when he was much younger, probably about 13 years ago, 14 years ago, and went to Arizona to school and became a vet tech and has come back. He's since uh, taken a job. He's working with Blue Pearl in Kansas City and volunteering out here. Uh, there's another volunteer, uh, Talon LaRue, who just recently got her uh, degree as a veterinarian um, last year and we got a wonderful thank you card from her after her graduation uh, because of the experiences that she had had out here now the, the percentage I would say it's probably roughly 30 percent or so of our volunteers just guesstimation that are in either the veterinary field or the animal field and are looking to continue that uh, we've got another volunteer that still comes back once a week, and she now works for the Kansas City Zoo. And this was th this was uh, instrumental in helping her to get that job as well. Uh, so um, several, I would say, um, we're always looking to to increase our, our volunteer base to increase their skill sets as well so that they can take that elsewhere uh, but just offhand i'd probably have to say about 30 percent or so that, that have come through in that field that we've been able to help foster along and help them along to the next stage so everybody that comes out here and sees this what do you wish they walked away and knew i i i hope that they leave here with a a larger perspective and awareness that they realize that maybe what the kardashians are doing right now isn't as important as a lot of other things that are going on there's so many and and again from my advertising background i look at it from the perspective that we have 24 hours in the day you know, if we're lucky, 16, 17 of that, that we're awake, people are fighting for every minute of our awareness, every minute of our attention to sell us something or to get us to feel some way or to get us to think about something in some way and to, to buy some product. I'm hopeful that this 
pulls people out of that group, out of that, that sort of rut that we're in and gives them a broader perspective to say, oh, we are a species amongst a myriad of species on a planet that we are overwhelming with our own presence. Let's at least have an awareness of that so we can start talking about it and discussing the problem so we can begin addressing solutions for it. So it's really that just, I'm just trying to pull people away from that little glass screen and say, there's so much more going on. And it's in a very precarious balance right now. And we are in a very unique position as both the detriment and the potential stewards of this to undo what could be a catastrophic failure of these ecosystems. You know, if you're, con if you're familiar with the concept of uh, the great filters, various things that would keep civilizations from reaching intelligence, from reaching certain degrees of, of advancement, that whether it's a meteorite that comes and wipes out civilization or they blow themselves up or they poison themselves or what have you, you know, there's, there's a very difficult road of recovery if we lose these ecosystems. So be aware of what's here so that we can start to preserve it now. Awesome. So the dream that was born 50 years ago is still alive. Exactly. And, and, it's you've, inspired, and you've got more dreams. It's inspired so many others. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing is, uh, I really feel like when I was working, I was living in the river market. I was coming out here four days a week to do this. And I was working for my clients, but I was not trying to foster any new business. I, I didn't feel as connected to the work that I was doing there as what I was doing out here. And this really helped to crystallize even though it's still so amorphous, it allowed me to crystallize a life's direction, allowed me to consolidate my interests and say, here's what I, I want to do with this. Here's a larger purpose that I can work to fulfill rather than just trying to fulfill the needs of the moment, et cetera. And in doing so, that set of challenges has fostered in myself my own set of dreams on top of this, which has been, okay, let's take what he's done and make it the best that we possibly can. You know, to make this a world-class facility of conservation education that has all of these different facets that can draw people in and engage them, no matter what level of interest they might have in any arena, that there's something here that will, will spark an interest and perhaps kindle that fire within themselves. Well, that's awesome. If you can just teach people a little of that, you're going to change the world. <laughs> exactly. Just, just make a small difference every day is the goal. Any last questions? It was great tour. Thanks for uh, thank showing us all around. Oh, pleasure. And, yeah, uh, you're getting a lot of applause here from everybody. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> just again, a, a shameless plug is. Um, saveoursiberians.org is our website and at the bottom of the homepage is a link to our YouTube channel which is just Cedar Cove Tiger Park and from there you'll find a number of videos there's one called Land for Tigers that talks about the history of the park what we're doing shows you all the new land through drone footage uh, but there's the animals themselves in the habitats playing so a variety of things I think you'll find enjoying up there you can share with others you can share with kids um, and, and hopefully come out here and visit awesome yep it's it's worth the drive for any of you that's it's a, a great visit it's a short drive it yep. seems like a long <laughs> way out here but on the way back it goes by in a blink. that's right all right well all of you have a great easter weekend i look forward to uh seeing you again next week thank you both thank you all so much really appreciate the opportunity Thanks so All much. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.